1974, I was a student at Yale studying architecture. And one of my professors came up and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm designing a solar heated house for Ireland. And he said, solar energy has nothing to do with architecture. And I couldn't understand that. He's a very famous architect. And we had had the energy crisis in 1973, so I didn't understand that at all. And so I went and built it myself by hand, thinking if I'm going to be telling people how to put something together, I better learn how to do it myself first. So I learned welding, metal bending, duct design, cabinetry, and just went and built the thing. Got some help from Norman Foster, some others, because I didn't know any better. I'd ask them for help and they'd give it to me. So when I moved to New York to be an architect, an intern there, in 1990, I'm sorry, 1984, I was asked to design the National Headquarters for Environmental Defense Fund. And I wanted to look at materials, health, safety, energy, quality of light, things like that. And I felt very alone. There were very few people at that time who were even thinking about these things. Very, very few. So we were alone for about five years. And then all of a sudden in 1990, we started to see interest pick up. And then that's when the AIA started to get interested in it. So we created the Committee on the Environment, and a few of us gathered around that issue. There was a great group of people that gathered. We had uh, Bill Browning, Bob Berkebile, Greg Franta, uh, people like that. And we got together and started looking at what this might mean. And in 1991, I was hired by the German government. They had won the world fair for 2000 for Hanover. And they asked me to write design principles for sustainability, which I did, called the Hanover Principles for the Hanover the city, the site of the World's Fair. And then they were given to the, the uh, Earth Summit as a gift. And so I represented the American Institute of Architects and the International Union of Architects at the Earth Summit in 1992. I think the Hanover principles still hold, and we use them every day, and so do people around the world. I find that very um, exciting, really, because we realize that having met Michael Braungart from Greenpeace Chemistry, having met people like Henry Lovins, having worked with people like John Todd, having known some of the great writers and leaders, including people like Buckminster Fuller, things like that, to pull all these things together into something that would inspire designers was really quite a challenge and a delightful prospect. And I think the trickiest part of it actually, strangely, was number three was respect the relationships between spirit and matter. And the engineers in Germany said, you, you can't have this. It's too fuzzy. It was number nine. It was the last one. And we said, no, no, well, let's make it number six, which later became eliminate the concept of waste. And they said, no, no, we're trying to remove it. And I said, well, let's make it number three. You see where we're going. And so it was left in as number three. But the indigenous people I talked to around the world um, said that's the only principle. And so I think this fundamental idea that human artifice in the natural world has to be understood very deeply and philosophically was what we wrote about in the Hanover Principles. There's a whole philosophical tract upon the relationship of humans to nature and the making of things. And that was new and that was important, but its dimension ranged from the idea of, of human intention and allowing humans and nature to coexist and thrive to understanding a spiritual dimension that is real. To some people, trees are sacred. To Eliminating the concept of waste, not minimize, avoid, reduce. Eliminate the concept of waste. Um, so it's different. And then be humble, because we find that most designers find they're looking for recognition. And in that, they often lose humility. And humility is critical, because you know, it took us 5,000 years to put wheels on our luggage. And we went to the moon before we put wheels on our luggage. So humility is important for designers. 
And then the last is, is to share. And so these are fundamental values that are being translated into value, not just numbers being translated into goals, but true human values. What is good? What is bad? What is right? What is wrong? These are principles for behavior that relate to almost a platonic value set of good, bad, whereas an Aristotelian scientific set of less more had brought us to the earth summit where people were saying being less bad is being good. When bad is a human value and less is a numerical relationship, it was very confusing because being less bad is not being good. It's being bad by definition, just less so. So the Hanover principles were there to say, let us do good. The first I heard about it was actually from Al Gore, who gave a talk and uh, he characterized me as the mastermind of sustainable design, because he had seen Hanover principles, and said, I think this is something we should bring to Washington. And so after they were elected, um, it was something that came up. And, and so when I heard about it, it was really after the AIA had had its meeting with the International Union of Architecture in Chicago, and there were 10,000 architects in the room. And I had the privilege of essentially opening it. And there were two fundamental things that struck me at that time. One was I got out on stage and I looked out and I said, how many people in this room know how to find True South? And I got four hands from 10,000 architects. And then I mentioned that we should change the way we make things and we can change our materials to be healthy and safe and, and deal with energy in different ways. And Helmut Jahn got up and argued that architects are powerless to change the way we make things, that industries do that. Architects' job is to just simply deploy. So I took exception to that. And, and so here we are, we're still at it all these years later. But it was interesting that that notion that we could actually start to do something resonated with Bill Clinton. And for him to say, I'm going to clean up my house if we're going to talk to other people was an important statement on his part. So the AIA and uh, the Committee on the Environment and SAGE at the time um, launched this design charrette that brought together a hundred people from so many different disciplines. Could you talk a little bit about that process? Well, all of these protocols require so many perspectives to come together that building a community of interest is typically the first step to any a process that's going to be somewhat successful. So the idea that you would get a gathering of the, effectively the, the best and brightest in your sectors to come together and talk about it from energy, materials, water, so on, um, was really critical. And the role I took in that group and was asked to take by the president was design quality. So while we had a lot of, sort of eco and economic and energy and water things going on, I was actually focused on, is it going to be beautiful? Because you could do the most efficient, well-lit, clean room and it would be white tile and you'd have to put yourself in a straitjacket because then you couldn't disturb it. And I don't know how happy you'd be locked up in that box. So, you know, it wasn't just about efficiency. It was also about effectiveness, communication, beauty. And there were certain areas where we really need to pay attention to that. I've never paid any attention to naysayers because they don't have much to offer except the word nay. So, you know, we, we see this as a ripe opportunity for innovation in a direction that is, is deliberate and is productive and is a, a gift. And so naysayers don't, you know, they sound like horses. If we look at what was going on at the Earth Summit with energy efficiency, various kinds of efficiencies, eco-efficiency, people were trying to do 
you know, more with less. They were trying to be less bad. They were trying to retool the existing systems. I think we're still there. The language has changed somewhat, but you know, because I'm now the chair of the Meta Council for Circular Economy at the World Economic Forum, I have an opportunity to see people engaging with these issues. But you must remember that if all we focus on is the economy, then we're not really talking about sustainability. We're still just talking about the metrics of triple bottom line thinking. And it's numerical and it's quantitative. The real question is also qualitative. And what have we done for the environment? What have we done for society? Not just what have we done for the economy? So I don't know that we've actually progressed as much as a lot of people think we might have. Because we still see in most of the metrics that are being presented, certainly in the built environment, people are setting goals of being 20% less carbon by 2020. Well then, what are you telling us? You're telling us what you're not going to do. You just It's like running out and jumping a taxi and saying, quick, I'm not going to the airport. You're telling us what you're not doing. And I still see that. So that's why we wrote the upcycle, is really we're talking about what do we want to do. And so we can talk about reducing what we don't want and increasing what we do, but let's be articulate about what we do want. And let's not just talk about numbers, let's talk about quality. So it really hasn't changed that much until we see that tip coming, but we're seeing bits of it. We're seeing people concerned about material health, whereas we started with that 25 years ago, and it's just starting to show up as a real consideration, and there's all kinds of ways people are looking at it, but it's mostly very thin, very superficial, just check some boxes and move on with your business, you know. So I don't know. I think it's I think we're ready, but it's really hard for so many people to integrate this into the work because it requires thought, care, and we're getting there. Tell us a little bit about some of your current projects. Like well, our current work is looking at the idea of the world gets better because we're here. So Back when I started working with uh, solar energy early or with David Orr at Oberlin, I posited the idea that if Le Corbusier said that a house is a machine for living in, does that mean a church is a machine for praying in? And if we just look at living machines, uh, we realize we can use natural systems as tools. So we can use constructed wetlands, we can use machines that are working with biological systems. And that's really great, So, but we're using nature as a machine. Um, so the real question I was asking was, what happens when humans become tools of nature? So that's the current work, is on the front of environment, is what happens when we're beneficial? What happens when we encourage biodiversity? What if, happens if we have the buildings that restore biodiversity in their locations, not just reduce their destruction of it. That's really exciting to me. So the idea of fecund buildings. So right now we're doing factories in India where we do nine things with every BTU of gas. We, we make oxygen, we make uh, water out of the air, we grow plants on the roof. We've, the whole, everything is becoming photosynthetic. And so we call these buildings that were alive and that idea has been picked up by a lot of people who thought it was pretty cool and took that as an inspiration, which is nice. But if we look at the the work today, we're designing buildings that are photosynthetic, cities that are photosynthetic, cities that are carbon positive, that put carbon back in soil and working form. I'm designing packaging now, I'm working with the polymer industries, we're designing new plastics for buildings, whole new systems that are very exciting as we go into the future. And then for Ice House at Davos, that's actually a project that I started five years ago to make housing for people in need around the world, for two billion people who don't have dignified homes. And so I've been looking for how to provide a building system for people that can be used by people in desperate need. And so that building, even though it was presented as a mock-up prototype to the wealthiest and most powerful people in the world, I did that so that they would have to ask a question, what is that? And it's just a clue of what we're about to do because it represents a new structural system that's made of only two pieces. And people don't realize that whole building structure was built in two days. It's so simple, four people, eight wrenches. So 
single tool type, two pieces, four people. Amazing. So um, it's really about looking for new materials that we can use that we can give people. And so I'm working with polymers. And so I'm looking for materials that are free or cheaper than free. Well, I think people who are concerned about biophilia or biomimicry are going back to some core understanding of what it means to be alive. And those are beautiful things. Now, when they get translated into technology, they can either be, you know, astonishing little replications of things that are found in natural systems. You know, geckos can walk on ceilings. That's very interesting. And if you do something like that, the question really becomes, what is your intention? Because the intention of the gecko is to catch a mosquito. The intention of a person has to be begged because the value of tools are put there by the intention of the person using it. A hammer doesn't know if it's good or bad. If you give it to a child, it's a toy. If you give it to a carpenter, it's a tool to build a house. And if you give it to an obsessed maniac, it's a weapon. See, the hammer doesn't know. So you could be biomimetic and be making weapons. So that your intention becomes important. So the idea of using nature as inspiration is obviously critical. With Cradle to Cradle, what Michael Braungart and I proposed is look at the world as biological nutrition, natural systems that go back to soil, basically, or as technical nutrition, materials that go back to industry forever. And don't contaminate the two with each other, for example and designed for safe, healthy systems. So lead doesn't know it's a heavy metal neurotoxin. It doesn't know it's a battery. It's the human that puts the value into the lead. So if I put it in rivers or child's brains, children's brains, it's a neurotoxin. If I put it in a battery, it's a technical nutrient. As soon as it sees the biosphere, it becomes a neurotoxin. So Defined systems, I think, are important. And so there's biology and there's technology. And I think we put the two together in exquisite ways. And we can use all objects of artifice from whatever, but make sure they're defined and they don't contaminate each other as we move forward. So we can use nature and we can use technology, of course, because we are nature. As an educator, what do you think needs to be done in order to help bring some of uh, this thinking uh, into, you know, greater focus for young people? Well, I, I'm very happy that Cradle to Cradle has been made a textbook around the world, which I find kind of delightful. Also, in a famous, uh, two famous English universities, very famous, um, it's used to teach rhetoric. Um, they're using that book to explain how to explain complex new ideas in ways that are understandable. They don't even teach the content, just the use of language. So I think for the young people, these ideas are natural to them. They don't understand why you would make something that pollutes the world. They don't understand why packaging from internet commerce has to look the way it does. It's like, I think people now have an ingrained sense that there's something wrong with what we've done, this living as if there's no tomorrow, the idea of planned obsolescence, fast fashion. The average American now is using buying 64 pieces of clothing a year. Um, the second largest, I think, export of the United States is, after agricultural products, is used clothing. So it, it's a strange and strange world we live in today. So I think the students want to be able to connect to what it means to do good work and the great work. And so I think they, they need to be given an opportunity to examine what that looks like from a principled basis. And, and that's really critical for the students and give them hope. It's very clear that innovation is the engine of commerce and that commerce is the engine of change. So as students are coming into the world of work, for example, and production, they have choices and they have a great opportunity to see a lot of choices very quickly all at once. And so I think the exciting things for people are to be able to do things that are principled. And innovation 
principled innovation is a primary opportunity for some young person to find blissful behavior in a meaningful way. So I, I see immense opportunity in, the, in these things. And we're seeing new technologies every day. That's what we work with here. We see new forms of energy we haven't seen before, literally brand new, coming in. And we're seeing them working. And they're surprising. Most scientists would turn and run. They knew what it was. We're seeing new materials like graphene coming in at scale all of a sudden within the last year that it, the implications are immense for a single layer of carbon and what it can do in terms of conductivity and heat, electricity and so on. Amazing. So there's all kinds of new things that are just going to be incredibly disruptive. And when you're 20 years old, disruption shouldn't be too scary. So, you know, we just see, we see this, the younger people coming in droves. Are there some things that you would like to uh, focus on? Well, right now I'm working on how to take polymers, plastics of all kinds around the world, and turn them into good use. Mine the garbage for free materials. Because in the first industrial revolution, nature never sent us a bill. The materials were there for the taking. We took the trees, we took the minerals, we took the rivers. And at this point, I think we should take the things we took before, retake them, remake them, and put them into human utility and a resourcefulness which puts the re back into resources. So we don't have to mine the earth again and destroy it in order to have things that we can share. Because what worries me now is the world is being seen as full of limits which causes us to have greed. So we see a world of limits and greed, and the question of commerce itself has become, how much can I get for how little I give? And I'd like to reverse that and say, the question can come to a world of abundance and sharing. So the question becomes, how much can we give for all that we get? So the idea of doubling our resources by reusing everything over and over again is a very short-term idea because we can triple, quadruple. It depends on how many generations we reuse things. So if all we do is design things that are poison and recycle them and say we're good because we're recycling, we're not good. We're just recycling poison. So untoward products being recycled are untoward products. So I'd like to see that idea of not wondering about end of life for products. These aren't living things. We should talk about end of use and next use like that. That's one thing. The other is carbon. I think we've seen carbon now as an enemy. And we talk about limiting our carbon, reducing carbon, bad carbon. Well, that's a sad thing. A carbon at this point in history has become a toxin. So a material in the wrong place is a toxin. Lead in a river is toxin. Carbon in the atmosphere is toxin at this point. Car there's nothing wrong with carbon. We are carbon. So there's good carbon and bad carbon. So I'm looking at good carbon. So we can reduce the bad carbon, of course. So nothing more to the atmosphere in terms of carbon. So we see carbon going to the soils as working carbon because it restores carbon balances and can accrue carbon in soil. A great place to accrue carbon is in roots of plants and in healthy soils. And then the other is what I call um, durable carbon, which is polymers and things like that. So instead of taking the plastics and then saying we have waste to energy and burning plastics, must be crazy. You're just putting it in the atmosphere. And so we look at those things and say these are materials as durable carbon for reuse. So let's start redesigning all the polymers so they can be reused. And let's take all the ones we've done, which are many of which are very indiscriminately considered, and put them into good use in terms of various materials or we can do pyrolysis to bring them back to, to methane and syngas, but let's do it in order to remake polymer, not burn it into the atmosphere. So I think I just see that two fundamental issues of our time right now are one would be atmospheric and the other would be material intelligence and management. I think it'd be nice to talk about the greening of the White House in terms of the implications and what we see still today that started there. I was last week with President Clinton at the winter meeting of the Clinton Global Initiative, which 
have a part. And President Clinton wrote the foreword to my last book, and he described the greening of the White House as when he and I met. And the fact that that has a durable memory for him is really important. That he said, this is the first time I heard about these things, and I heard them from Bill, and you know, it changed the way we do things. And that's why I wrote the foreword to the book. Well, that's interesting. So when you look at the Clinton Global Initiative, or you look at the World Economic Forum, or you look at many of the things going on out there that are seen as world leadership agendas, the fact that we have this issue in there still as a running meme, it may not be front and center, but that's because we have wars and economics and, and other dire issues of instant concern to so many people. But we still have this underlying question of why can't we be better all the time, not just less bad. I think that's a really durable notion that there's still hope out there, that someday these things will rise to the front without having to push other things aside. It's all one thing. Well, for someone like me, the things that concerned me during the Great of the White House had to do with subtle dimensions that weren't ready to be dealt with, but needed to be understood. And so I had to keep pushing on that. One was the aesthetics, that the green building movement is typically dismissed by the design community at large as being a fringe or marginal thing, or it was at the time, because they didn't think it was necessarily beautiful, because a lot of people who were dealing with aesthetics and trying to get recognition in architecture and design didn't have the bandwidth to think about these issues, so they just dismissed it as a non-aesthetic issue. So they could use that as an excuse not to sort of wrap their brains around it. But we really do need to bring our aesthetic brains to this issue as well. So that, I think, was an opportunity that we were able to sort of start to bring into position. Um, the other was that the push for compact fluorescence, which was everybody was doing all the time, Watching that from a distance, one of the reasons I didn't get involved in the, all the lighting, energy efficiency, because everybody kept walking into these meetings holding these compact fluorescents as if they had a new idea. And all I could see was somebody holding mercury over their head. That's all I could see. So we're going to substitute tungsten with mercury for the sake of some energy efficiency? I have just found that very disturbing. So when we put out the idea of the product as a service in Cradle to Cradle and before, we were very much anticipating the world of LEDs when we could have gallium and indium and deploy them as products of service, which we're now seeing in Europe with Philips, who's adopted our strategy. And they now sell light instead of light fixtures because these fixtures are designed to go back to them because they can use these materials again. And so that whole idea of getting away from the toxic nonsense that we use to, to do some energy efficiency, it, but it wasn't time, you see. The, the gallium uh, LED hadn't been invented, the blue. So we didn't have white LEDs then. We had to wait. So that, that was a little anxious for me. I had to, we have to wait. But we don't have to wait anymore. It's time. Would you have you know, thought that what you were doing as a model with the greening of the White House in terms of government itself and government buildings and institutions would have taken off the way it has? I think the, the adoption by the regulators of these agendas is critical. And when Leibniz said, if it is possible, therefore it exists. That's the world I live in, right? the world of the possible. To me, that exists. That's why I don't worry about naysayers, because I'm not dealing with their world. I'm dealing with the next world. So uh, the question becomes, how do we get that next world articulated? I think the regulators can benchmark against examples most effectively, because they can see what society needs. And it's very powerful if we make the examples they can point at and say, therefore, you know, society would like it like that. 
if they have something to point at. That's very helpful. So I think it's been very powerful that we've had things like the work that came out of AIA or the Screen Building Council or BREAM in the UK that can set up standards that people could use as a reference point. And that would allow, we're doing the same thing, by the way, with the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, which we formed. It's a third party, independent, peer reviewed certifying body. So it's for the public. Good. It's not in the public world. But it allows regulators to point at it and say, look, these people are doing it. Here's a published standard. This is legitimate. You can do this too. So I think that the fact that the regulatory universe has had the ability to start to integrate these things is testimony to a lot of practitioners who have worked really hard to put real examples in the world that we could point at. And in, in terms of government, one of the great things about working with NASA on their space station, when they asked me to help with Mars space station, uh, which would be for me the equivalent of the greening of the White House, but it would be the greening of Mars, you know, that's pretty cool. 20 years later. Um, but we said we can't go to the red planet until we come back to the blue one. What have you learned in space that we can bring back to Earth? And we did that. So working with NASA's teams who designed the International Space Station, we designed a building on Earth that can make 20% more energy than it requires from renewables and a building that can purify its own water. And the base building was cheaper than a normal federal office building ahead of schedule. So can you imagine that? So all of a sudden we left behind all be less bad to being a building like a tree. The building is fecund. You know? And we said to the rocket scientists here on Earth, we say, you know, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to do something smart, but what if you were? So why don't we apply you to buildings and see what we can do? So we had so much fun with that. So I think there's a federal agency or an administration doing it for business reasons within the parameters of conventional practice of a federal building and achieving that result just because they could. Isn't that amazing? Nobody regulated them into it. It's exciting. Some of the things we're doing now in packaging and products are very exciting to me because we've expanded design into every scale, molecule, building, region, country, globe, like that. But when you get down to working at that level, you find out that these principles, when applied to something as prosaic as polymer, plastic. This is a plastic made by BASF, the world's largest chemical company, designed to be perfectly biodegradable. But look how beautiful it is. It's, a, it's a, basically a new recipe they developed. But what struck me is not just that it's perfectly biodegradable polymer, but look how beautiful it is. So. The idea that we would have cost, performance, and aesthetics is interesting. So you're not showing some, you know, black, cruddy looking piece of plastic flower pot and saying it's better because it's recycled stuff. You're actually looking at something that's like rendered exquisite ecologically as well as aesthetically. I mean, I call this solid light and it doesn't need an artificial finish. This is just what it is. It's what it looks like. I find that delightful. What I see around the world is the desperate need for humans to wage peace fiercely. And that we actually are engaged in an act of love for each other and for the world. And that we need to engage it with great vigor and determination. And when I look back at my own life and I see my parents coming to Japan after the Second World War, I was born in Tokyo. My father was a Japanese language officer for General MacArthur. And he and my mother were part of a cadre of 200 families, couples, who were sent by MacArthur into Japan after the signing of the treaty, trained in Japanese law, language, and custom without uniforms, without paperwork, without weapons, without marked jeeps, to go and wage peace fiercely. This would be like going into Iraq wearing Aloha shirts, speaking Farsi. That would have been interesting. 
But that's what they did. They waged peace. And I think we need that a great deal now. Because the children, if we don't love all the children being born, if we start seeing population as only being a problem, and we don't love every child that's born, oh my goodness. And if we don't take care of each other, as we see with the refugee crisis, my, my goodness, can you imagine being a refugee? And having people debating whether or not they should take care of you? I mean, what a horrifying prospect. So I think it's time for our compassion to rise to our own occasion. And we have to ask ourselves not what does it mean to be less bad, or less unsafe, or less unjust, or less this or that. We have to ask ourselves in a positive way, what is our goal? And our goal can be, how do we love all the children of all species for all time? That's a worthy question. And then we can ask ourselves not just how to be less bad, but set our goals as a, as a positive set of goals. So our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, clean soil, clean energy, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. Get fierce. This is, this is about the message and the medium. I've found that having the opportunity to work with celebrities, which happens just naturally in this world, uh, has been effective in terms of getting a message out. They do have an astonishing power to communicate because of people's interest. But I think the main thing is the examples. Let's do the work. Let's put down our tools. Let's show people what it looks like. But let us celebrate not just the pessimism of the glass is half empty or the optimism of the glass is half full. Let's be more scientific about this. At the same time, let's understand what it means to grow, which is what living things do. So instead of a glass being half full or half empty, we can say it's always full of water and air. And it's never big enough. So let's just make the glass bigger. And if we reuse things that are healthy and safe over and over across generations, just like the earth did before we started stripping it of its fecundity, the soil was building. China farmed the same soil for 5,000 years. How do you do that? How do you farm the same soil for 50 centuries? Imagine. Well, that's because the soil is building, because carbon's coming from the atmosphere. Nitrogen's coming from the atmosphere into the soils. Isn't that amazing. Phosphate is circulating. Solar energy is driving the system. And the soil is building until you're on the Great Plains and it's 16 feet deep. Oh, how beautiful. So a living world is a growing world. A dying world is a shrinking world. So that's what I think is really the key is for our understanding. Let's, let's grow the things we love and let's stop growing the things we hate. And stop hating anything. Especially the children, because if we don't take care of all the children, they will grow up to hate the world. And if they grow up to hate the world, they'll destroy the world. So you mentioned that you're designing things for people who are 10 years old and yeah. younger. Yeah. Talk about that for just a moment. Our basic protocol here and in my companies is to design for 10-year-old children around the world. So the housing we're designing and the systems we're building are for 10-year-olds to be inspired by. And our city designs are based on 10-year-olds being able to go freely everywhere they want to go without getting run over by cars or something. Because I was able to wander around Hong Kong as a 10-year-old child. And it was so much fun. I loved it. My parents weren't afraid. I could go into the Chinese markets and disappear for hours and be fascinated by the snakes and the birds and the odd pottery and the beautiful bamboo weavings and whatever, you know. And I was safe. And I think that wonderment is really critical. So I designed for 10-year-old kids. And, and that, don't forget, I mean, they will be the ones who execute against this anyway. So why am I designing for 60-year-olds with money when I could be designing 10-year-olds who are going to be running the place in 10 years? And having the privilege of working with NASA, just remember the 
statement by Kennedy that we'd be on the moon in 10 years because of our embarrassment that the Russians had gotten there first, basically, into space. When he said we'll be on the moon in 10 years, we were on the moon in nine years. And the average age of the team that put Neil Armstrong on the moon was something like 28, which means when Kennedy said we're going to the moon, they were in high school. <laughs> right? Who put Neil Armstrong on the moon? High school students who didn't know any better and went and did it. That's what we're doing here.